Can you hear me okay now, Sarah? Yes, Hello? I can hear you now. Okay. I'm going to get started with an introduction if you're all right with that. Yeah, go for it. All right, great. Now I'll record. All right, wonderful. Well, welcome to uh, this special event uh, put together by a couple of different groups here. So we've got Andy Bunn and the Polaris Project. It's Thursday afternoon here in Alaska, but it's evening where many of you are, and I know we have people logged in from around the world. Uh, and this is being hosted by Polar Trek. I'll tell you about that in just a second. But we'll be recording this presentation, and it will be available as an archive. Um, my name is Sarah. I work for the Arctic Research Consortium up here in Fairbanks, Alaska, and work with that Polar Trek program. So as you're uh, listening into the presentation, it would be great if you could all in the chat box tell us who you are and um, where you're coming from. And if you happen to have anybody else with you or if you're just by yourself, it will help us keep track of the number of people who are logged in listening to the presentations. Also, just to give you an idea of how this uh, presentation platform works, it's called Blackboard Collaborate. And this is just a quick slide to let you know um, how this will be working. So the slides will be shown on the right. And they should be switching slides, so they should be changing. If a slide hasn't changed for you yet, please let us know in the chat box. Um, if you're interested in having the video showing, you can start to see some of our presenters over there uh, getting ready. Um, if it's too much of a delay, you can close that window. If it's sort of driving you crazy, you'll still be able to hear everybody. All right, um, at the end, we'll try and have time for some questions. And to do that, you can ask in the chat box throughout the presentation if you'd like to. Um, but also, you can press the talk button to speak and unclick to finish talking. And when you are ready to ask a question, it would be great if you can raise your hand. So there's a, uh, a symbol right near the participants list where you can raise your hand and let us know that you do have a question. And we'll kind of call on you and, and see how it goes that way. Uh, again, keep chatting throughout the presentation and uh, let us know if you have any questions that way or having any trouble with any of the connections. Just really quick, I'd love to share with you um, the program that is helping out Polaris Project with these webinars. And the reason that we're doing that with Polar Trek here is we have a teacher that is going out with this group who will explain themselves in just a second. Paricio, who is online here with us, is heading out with the Polaris Project, um, and they'll talk more about it. But we offer the opportunity for K-12 teachers to head out on research expeditions to the Arctic and Antarctic. And the goal is for them to increase their scientific content knowledge, to bring that back to the classroom, and to bring polar science uh, into the classrooms. So that's our goal. Um, if anybody has any questions about that, just let me know. But I'm going to turn it over to Andy here. Andy, do you feel like you're ready? Sure thing. All right. I'll put your uh, up make here clear and you that you're in charge now. Okay. So for those that are following, um, I might be showing up on your screen as being John Shade, the moderator. I'm not. I'm Andy Bunn, who's just uh, I logged in as John as a moderator link. So if that's confusing to you. Uh, you'll have to you'll have to deal with it. Um, so thanks, Sarah, for setting it up and doing all of the uh, technical stuff. And uh, thanks to uh, John, Shade, the real John Shade, for organizing the seminar series. It's great to be here, and uh, it's been great to see all the Polaris folks, and now to have it expanded to people beyond the Polaris project. So, uh, Max, the program director, asked me to talk a little bit about uh, a big sort of picture overview. This is a seminar that I've given on the barge when we've been in Russia uh, many times, and uh, I'm not going to travel to Russia this year. I'm going to take the summer off and concert on other research projects. But I, uh, we have the opportunity through these webinars to uh, run through a couple talks right now. So this is one of them. So what you see in front of you, can everyone uh, hear and see and all that? And raise, if there are any questions, you can enter them in the, uh, in the chat box right now, and I'll try and, I'll try and respond. So unless there's any objections, I'll go ahead. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, 
So what you're looking at on the screen right now is, is the instrumental temperature record. And I'm sure a lot of this is going to be old ground for some of you. Um, but you know, there's always something you can get out of these things. Uh, this is sort of an average of a bunch of different instrumental temperature series, you know, going back to the beginning of the historical record and going up to uh, going up, you know, roughly to the present. Um, these are data from thermometers. They're data from satellites. They're data from uh, ocean buoys, et cetera. And they all sort of they show the same. They all show the same general trend, which is that. There was a period of sort of flat temperatures in the early part, decline in temperatures even in the early part of the instrumental record as we came out of the Little Ice Age. Um, we rebounded out of the Little Ice Age from 1900 and up to around 1940. There's a period of sort of flat temperatures from this uh, post-war period. And then starting in 1970 and going upward, we embarked on what we call the modern global warming period period when global temperatures really started to increase. And it's at this point that we think we understand the attribution behind them. We think it's a result of increasing concentrations of greenhouse gas uh, gases in the atmosphere. And so what I want to do today is I'm not going to talk about instrumental temperature record. I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, climate science or the IPCC, et cetera. What I really want to do today is talk more about the history of how we know what we know about climate change and kind of try to frame things in a logical way as opposed to just talking about uh, just talking about the, the science. So I want to kick it off by talking about Occam's razor. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard Occam's heard the phrase Occam's razor. Maybe you've studied it formally. Um, maybe it's new to you. Occam's razor, in its simplest uh, form, is it's called the law of succinctness. And it's used in philosophy. It's used in science. Um, and it basically says that if you have multiple competing hypotheses that are equal in other ways, you tend to choose the hypothesis that introduces the fewest assumptions. In lay terms, it usually expresses that the simplest answer tends to be the right answer. Okay, all things being equal, the best, the simplest answer tends to be the right answer. And it's a really great way of thinking about science. And I, I use this for approaching scientific questions uh, you know, in my own research, uh, and when I try and incorporate new kinds of scientific knowledge, when I'm trying to learn something new. So here, I teach um, I teach a couple of different classes at the university where I, where I am at Western Washington University. I teach a 300 level class in global change for non majors. I teach a calculus based climate uh, uh, climate class for seniors and graduate students, and I teach a class, you know, a couple classes in energy. And we talk about climate and all of these things. And uh, we can save the students a lot of tuition money by just explaining this one simple thing to them. Most of my classes revolve in some way around this phenomenon. Um, carbon dioxide is a heat trapping gas. And if you put a heat trapping gas into the atmosphere, you expect it to trap heat. That's Occam's razor in climate change and it's in a nutshell. We've known carbon dioxide as a heat trapping gas from over 100 years of sort of careful physics. We know it's accumulating in the atmosphere. Occam's razor tells us that if we put a heat trapping gas in the atmosphere, we expect it to trap heat. There might be another explanation for why that wouldn't happen, okay, but it's not going to be the simplest answer. And if so, it requires a higher burden of proof. So the analogy that's often used with folks, and you've probably heard before, is that you know it's adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere is like putting a blanket uh, an extra blanket of heat, that will, uh, extra blanket that will trap heat in the atmosphere. Okay, it's like putting an extra blanket on you when you go to bed at night. You go to bed at night expecting that blanket to trap heat to keep you warm, and that's why you put an extra blanket on on a cold night. Now, there's always a chance that there'll be a monkey underneath the bed that's going to come out from underneath the bed and pull the blanket off you. Okay, but you do not go to bed expecting uh, to be attacked by a monkey in the night. And the same thing is true with climate change. Okay. We expect the heat, the carbon dioxide, to trap heat. We, the instrumental data can, uh, lines up well with the physics. So that's what we tend to think is happening. The simplest answer tends to be the right one. And the secret to what's really sort of trying to understand climate science in the really big picture like this is to understand that the basic science of the greenhouse effect, the physics behind the greenhouse effect, is very, very well understood. And sometimes the uh, students, particularly students I have that are um, might not be uh, physical science majors, 
uh, will argue this with me, but I, what I tell them is this, is that, that this is easy to understand because it's physics, and physics is easy. Okay, we've understood the basic physics behind the greenhouse effect um, for really over about 120 years of, of physics. It goes back to some of the, the really great pioneering work in physics that was done in the 19th century, along with work in thermodynamics, et cetera. So it's easy to understand what's going on with climate change because it's physics, and physics is easy. And we know that adding carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide and these other heat trapping gases has increased what we call the radiative forcing on the, on the planet um, by a couple of watts per meter squared. Okay, so it's, it's trapping, it's trapping uh, power uh, at the Earth's surface, which causes the planet to warm up. That's, that's uh, bound on the other side by changing to aerosols, okay, particles in the atmosphere that cause cooling. But we think on net that there's about a one and a half, maybe more, watt per meter square forcing on the planet. And we can calculate this. It's not controversial uh, in, a phys in a sense, the sense of physics. It's a fairly well understood phenomenon of physics. And we know that these heat trapping gases are accumulating in the atmosphere. So this is the way that I try and think about climate change, to try and think about it from this perspective, this really simple perspective of Occam's razor. So let's look at a little bit more, let's look at a couple of more sort of slides of data where I can kind of make my point that this, these heat trapping gases are accumulating in the atmosphere. And this is probably the kind of lecture you've heard a couple of times before. You, know, we, you show graphs like this that show the greenhouse gases are going up in the atmosphere. This is uh, uh, data from, the, from ice cores and in situ measurements that show you know, roughly instrumental period of how carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere, how methane is accumulating in the atmosphere, how these uh, really big funky compounds, CFCs, these human-made compounds are accumulating in the atmosphere. And we know that these, from the physics behind the shape of these molecules, that they trap outgoing long-wave radiation from the planet and they cause the planet to warm up. This is all pretty basic, pretty simple climate science. Okay? Um, you'd look at it maybe further on. You'd look at, at a slide like this. You'd see going back further in time. Um, this is over sort of the last part of the Holocene, showing carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide. And, and I'm actually a paleoclimatologist by training, and I get really interested in the various wiggles in the flat part of the uh, last uh, 2,000 years of why there's variations in carbon dioxide and methane. But the uh, focusing on the wiggles in the flat part is really to ignore the, the exponential increase in the modern era. Um, this really shows you what's going on in terms of the physics of the planet. We're changing the physics, the radiative balance of the planet, by changing these heat trapping gases. Okay. Go back even further, you look at these, these very, very long data sets from the Vostok ice core, okay, going back uh, half a million years, uh, almost half a million years here, and now this data set goes back even further. Um, that shows the relation, it shows carbon dioxide in the atmosphere going back over the recent glacial and interglacial cycles. And so you can see that we're right at the end of the uh, blue line where the red line starts. I'll try and uh, actually sort of point it out. Right around here um, is the current interglacial period. Okay, that's the Holocene. That's the last 10,000 years of stable climate that we've enjoyed and all of civilization has flourished. And for that, we are in this, uh, the last gl uh, glacial period, okay, during the last ice age when, when those of you that are going to be in Russia this summer when uh, you're, you're not going to be in boreal forest 100,000 years ago up in Chersky, you're going to be on a mammoth tundra ecosystem, okay, the world's largest grassland ecosystem. So this goes back from, from uh, glacial period to interglacial period uh, to glacial period and so on going back in time. Now, these wiggles sort of pale in comparison to what's going on now. This is the industrial record. This, this current level right here of atmospheric carbon dioxide going up is unique in the geologic, recent geologic record of the planet. Okay, and in fact, it's been uh, 15 million years since, uh, where's my slide? There it goes. It's been 15 million years since carbon dioxide levels were this high. And this is really, this phenomenon is, is happening, that's, that's taking carbon out of the ground and putting it into the atmosphere, okay? evaporating our coal mines and putting them up in the atmosphere. Um, and it's been 15 million years since the planet has looked like this. Now, in most of the students that are here, uh, carbon dioxide is going to double in your lifetime, and it's going to triple in your kid's lifetime. Okay, and we're going to be up here off the chart um, by, the end of the, by the end of the century. Okay? It's a really phenomenal change to the radiative balance of the Earth uh, uh, 
is the Earth's physics. Okay? It's really changing the radiation budget fundamentally. So if I were giving a talk like this, if I were going to keep on going in a, in a, to a crowd of scientists, I might go in and start talking about the shape of carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide molecules and why the shape of that molecule traps radiation at certain wavelengths and how that, uh, those vibrate and spin and affect the radiative balance of the planet. Um, but what I do, I get, I get called a lot of times in my, in my professional life to go talk to people that have no scientific training about how climate change works. And what I've found over the, over the last couple of years is that most people really respond to, if, even if they have no scientific training, they really respond well to storytelling and they really respond well to understanding history. And so the method I've come up with for explaining how climate change works to people that might not have a lot of scientific training uh, has to do with talking about the history of climate change. Okay? And here's the bottom line. The, remember, the Occam's razor rules over all. Occam's razor tells us the simplest answer tends to be the right one. And the simplest answer says that we know carbon dioxide is a heat trapping gas. So the best way I've found to explain this to people who might not have a lot of scientific training is to explain this in terms of the history. Um, okay, here's the three great dead white guys of climate change science. Okay, Fourier, Tyndall, and Arrhenius. Um, you know, Fourier was this amazing mathematician. He uh, um, worked his fundamental work in uh, what became a signal processing and time series uh, statistics, um, uh, invented sort of an entire branch of mathematics. Um, you know, really just an amazing, an amazing phenomenon. Um, in addition to all the work he did on mathematics, though, he was also the first one to really understand and pioneer studies of the planet's energy balance. And that's all climate science is. Climate science is nothing more than accounting. It's just trying to figure out how much energy is coming into the planet and how much energy is going out of the planet. It's a, it's a, it's a fundamental conservation problem in, uh, in science. Okay, you gotta, it's just uh, balancing the books. And Fourier was the first one that really took a, a whack at doing this. And what he realized is that there must be some kind of radiation, which we now know is infrared radiation, uh, to balance out incoming solar radiation. Okay, he knew that the account had to equal, but he didn't know what it was. And he, he, he inferred that there was this, what he called the dark heat, okay, this infrared radiation to balance incoming visible solar radiation. And so without considering how the atmosphere works, really, he thinks that the Earth should be much colder than it is. He's right. Okay? Without, uh, uh, without understanding the atmosphere, he thinks that the Earth should be, much, uh, should be frozen. So he concluded, without understanding the chemistry or the physics of the atmosphere, that somehow the Earth acts as a glass house, okay, trapping heat. But he's not sure what causes this effect. So we owe the terminology of the greenhouse effect, uh, you know, going back, we understand that going back to Fourier. So, but Fourier didn't know what was causing this, okay? He didn't, uh, he didn't know, he didn't understand the gases that were in the atmosphere. No one really did uh, until uh, Tyndall came along, okay? And Tyndall was another amazing scientist, uh, surveyor, um, all around sort of uh, polymath and, and scientific giant. Um, he was also really good at making instruments. He was really good with measurements. And so he was the one that came along and connected specific gases to the greenhouse effect. So he was able to build instrumentation that was to measure the radiative property of different gases. And wrote in uh, uh, this one quote that's, that's sort of become uh, famously, uh, is Tyndall's most famous quote, that Earth would be held fast in the iron grip of frost if not for greenhouse gases. And so Tyndall was able to sort of build on the work that Fourier had done on basic planetary physics and was, was able to show that without any sort of greenhouse effect, the Earth would be much colder. In fact, it would be frozen. So there had to be, again, going back to Tyndall, there had to be this glass house trapping in, um, uh, trapping in what Fourier called the dark heat. Now, one problem with the greenhouse effect analogy is, like all analogies, it, it breaks down. And so the... The, what you should understand if, if anyone asks you about the greenhouse effect and how it works is that the greenhouse effect does not work like the greenhouse effect does in a greenhouse for plants. The greenhouse effect in, um, in a greenhouse that you, that you use to grow plants in works by suppressing convection. It doesn't work by trapping outgoing uh, long wave radiation the way that the greenhouse effect does when we talk about climate. So it's an imperfect analogy, but we're stuck with it. Um, and, uh, and Fourier and Tyndall did many other great things. We can forgive them for, for an imperfect analogy. What Tyndall wrote was that 
uh, greenhouse gases are a local dam by which the temperature of the Earth's surface is deepened. The dam, however, finally overflows and we give to space all that we receive from the sun. So Tyndall was talking at this point about these uh, fundamental formulas that we use in physics that have to do with conservation of energy and the conservation of mass. Okay, these conservation laws are, are the most important part of understanding physics. And he understood that the energy that was coming in had to equal the energy that was going out. And he did that. Uh, he was at, and Tyndall was the one who was able to measure specific greenhouse gases and tie them to their radiative properties and calculate the energy balance of the Earth. It was a really marvelous thing, incredible thing to be able to do. This was a golden era of, uh, of physics. This was when sort of fundamental work was being done in thermodynamics, uh, steam engines, all this sort of great uh, basic physics was, was being done. The next real advancement that came in understanding the climate of the Earth and then really became how we understand uh, cl modern climate change came along with Arrhenius. Arrhenius was, again, like these other guys, an unbelievable scientist. He won the Nobel Prize. Uh, in chemistry for his, uh, basically it was a Lifetime Achievement Award in chemistry, he won the Nobel Prize, I think it was 1908. Um, he basically invented chemical thermodynamics, um, did, did basic work describing ions, uh, and sort of in his spare time made the first estimates of what the sensitivity was of the, uh, of the Earth's climate to atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide. Okay? So he made the first estimate of what would happen if you doubled atmospheric carbon dioxide. And this is what he wrote. By the influence of the increasing percentage of carbonic acid in the atmosphere, okay, so uh, Arrhenius was a chemist and was used to studying carbon when CO2 in a solution when it becomes carbonic acid. So for Arrhenius, um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was carbonic acid. Um, so he said, by the influence of the increasing percentage of carbonic acid in the atmosphere, we may hope to enjoy ages with more equitable and better climates, especially as regards to the colder regions of the Earth ages when the Earth will bring forth much more abundant crops than at present for the benefit of a rapidly propagating mankind. Okay, he was uh, from Sweden, so he thought warming up was going to be a, you know, a wonderful thing. Um, and we'd be able to, uh, we'd be able to feed, feed the growing population. Now, what Arrhenius had done was he had written this paper after sort of years of careful work on this. He'd basically written some of the earliest uh, climate models to do this. They were mathematical models. Um, he built on the work that had been done by, by Fourier and by Tyndall and wrote this paper in 1896 on the influence of carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature of the ground. And he went through and made these calculations for what was going to happen to the temperature on the planet if you doubled atmospheric carbon dioxide. Now, this came out in 1896. The, all of the climate models that we're running right now that try to uh, figure out what's going on with the climate out to, say, 2100 or beyond are doing the same thing that Arrhenius did in 1896. They're trying to figure out what happens if you double atmospheric carbon dioxide. Okay, Arrhenius sent the benchmark of which we're still trying to solve the, solve the answer to the question. But Arrhenius made a couple of predictions. He predicted that the Earth would warm up um, about, uh, I think it was four to six degrees roughly on average, okay, about what we think it is now. Uh, he was on a little, little bit on the high side, didn't really understand how aerosols worked. Uh, he thought that nights would warm faster than days because you were affecting the long wave portion of the radiation budget. He thought that the poles would warm faster than the mid latitudes. Okay. All these sort of basic predictions of greenhouse change were figured out by Arrhenius in 1896. And the reason Arrhenius was able to figure this all out and get the basics of everything right in 1896 is that the physics hasn't changed. You know, the physics of how the planetary system works and how it responds to heat trapping gas in the atmosphere have not changed since 1896. Okay? We're trying to answer the same question that Arrhenius was trying to answer in 1896. He got it almost right then. He made a couple of mistakes. He got it almost right. And we're just we're, we're, uh, we're building on that. And so that's goes back to that basic understanding of the science of the greenhouse effect is very, very well understood. The physics are, the physics are simple. It's black body radiative physics, the kind that, that kids learn in high school. Now, Arrhenius did make a sort of fundamental uh, mistake, however. Arrhenius made a mistake that whatever carbon was being added into the atmosphere was going to dissolve into the oceans. And 
he didn't know how much carbon there was in these different pools in the planet. He didn't know he didn't know where he didn't know exactly how much carbon there was. But he said, okay, there's something like uh, you know 600 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, the ocean has way way more, maybe 38,000 billion tons of carbon. So therefore, he thought that okay, only about 1.6 of any added carbon dioxide is going to stay in the atmosphere, and the rest is going to get dissolved in the ocean. So remember, Arrhenius is a chemist. And chemists fundamentally are interested in reactions. And the thing about chemical reactions is that they react. Okay, so if you add carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, you know carbon dioxide will dissolve into water and make carbonic acid. So you assume as a chemist that this, this reaction will run and that all the carbon they add to the atmosphere by burning up coal. I mean, Rainus was a child of the Industrial Revolution. He thought that all this coal that we're going to add to the atmosphere is just going to sink into the oceans. So Arrhenius thought that this warming that he predicted by doubling atmospheric CO2 wasn't going to happen, or it wasn't going to happen for uh, millennia, or at least centuries, maybe millennia, because he thought it was going to take a long time to get atmospheric carbon dioxide up to those levels. Arrhenius actually wasn't interested in climate change in terms of adding carbon to the atmosphere and causing climate change. He was more interested in this, this, this most basic uh, the question that consumed geologists and, uh, and earth scientists at the time, which was the question of the ice ages. And that's really why Arrhenius had gotten into this game in the first place. Um, so Arrhenius never thought that this warming, this anthropogenic warming, was going to happen. And really, neither did most scientists for another 60 years. There were some exceptions, people like Guy Callender. Um, but really, 60 years went by, and people just assumed that, OK, they said, well, we understand the physics. We understand that carbon dioxide is a heat trap gas. But we don't think it's accumulating in the atmosphere. And really, that's the way that that uh, the science progressed for about 60 years until a guy named Roger Revelle really got uh, uh, really many different threads of Roger Revelle's research came together to point out that carbon dioxide was accumulating in the atmosphere. And in 1957, um, Revelle and Soyce wrote this, uh, what's become a, uh, probably the most quoted uh, uh, quoted sentence in um, in the in the geosciences. In 57, he wrote, the human beings are now carrying out a large-scale geophysical experiment of a kind that could not have happened in the past nor be reproduced in the future. And it's important to note here that Revell meant uh, experiment in sort of the most benign uh, benign sense at the time. Um, Roger Revell is a neat guy. He was a, he was a, uh, he was a chemist. Uh, he was a chemist that realized way back in the 30s and 40s that, that seawater was this really complex uh, soup. It wasn't just H2O. There's a lot of going on. There's a lot of uh, a lot of issues uh, going on with with how we don't and, you know we don't fundamentally don't understand how the oceans work. We don't understand how fast they turn over. Uh, he said before that, I think in in 1952, that uh, that anyone that told you if we, that we knew how the ocean circulated was wrong. We don't know if ocean circulation takes uh, decades or centuries or millennia. Um, so he was this, he did this really neat sort of basic science as a young man. Uh, here he's studying, re studying seawater chemistry in 1936. And then he became a leading administrator of science um, down here in 1957 as administrator of science. I notice when you can still uh, smoke in the lab. Uh, and advocated for uh, this very broad understanding of how, of, of understanding how the Earth works. And he was this amazing administrator of science for the, for the rest of his career. And what made Ravel and Soyce understand this, uh, this, this, this quote about this large-scale geophysical experiment had to do with Ravel pulling together a bunch of different threads of his own research and other people's research that had to do with how carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater. And so here I'll just go back. There's, here's the only chemistry that I'll, I'll cover. There's other people on this, uh, uh, in this webinar right now that are much more accomplished uh, chemists than I am. Um, but this is, I think, the most important thing that kept people from understanding climate science, climate change, uh, from the time of Arrhenius until the modern period, is this assumption that all the carbon that was being added into the atmosphere was going to dissolve into the oceans. So until that point, that had been the, the, that had been the assumption. It was Ravel that pulled together um, things that had already been known, okay, this, these reactions had already been known, but no one had pulled them together and put and tried to understand them in terms of what was the reaction from the atmosphere down into the oceans. Most people were interested in how fast 
carbon would come out of the oceans if the if climate changed in terms of the, these glacial and interglacial cycles. Even in de Ravel's time, um, people were still mostly interested in, in trying to understand the pacings of the ice ages. Okay, Ravel sort of inverted the equation and tried to figure out what was going on with all this carbon dioxide that we were adding into the atmosphere right now. So the simple model was this one, okay, which was just that if you take CO2 and you add it to water, you form carbonic acid. So CO2 plus H2O makes carbonic acid, H2CO3. In the ocean, um, the ocean is, is buffered, okay, uh, and other reactions start taking place, okay. Carbon, uh, carbonic acid uh, becomes, becomes bicarbonate, okay. So carbonic acid becomes bicarbonate and the hydrogen peels off, okay. So we know that this is now affecting pH and acidity. Um, and then furthermore, bicarbonate becomes carbonate in the ocean. Now this is the, the if you study oceanography at all, this is the, uh, this is the, the carbonate pump in the ocean. Um, and this is sort of basic uh, textbook oceanography stuff now, but Ravel was the first one that wrote it all out and balanced this equation and wrote that, you know, if you, carbon dioxide plus water is not this straight reaction that just forms carbonic acid, but because the ocean is, is buffered, the ability to dissolve carbon dioxide depends on the concentration of these carbonate ions, um, carbonate and bicarbonate, and those are controlled by ocean pH. So what Ravel figured out, along with, with others, um, is that the factor that the oceans can absorb carbon dioxide is reduced by a factor of about 10 as a result of this, of balancing this, this, uh, this equation. Um, this is now called the Ravel factor in, in, the honor, in honor of Roger Ravel. What this meant for climate science is that the assumption, again, had been that all this carbon dioxide that was being added in the atmosphere was just being sunk into the oceans. That had been the assumption from Arrhenius onward. Ravel showed that, in fact, carbon dioxide was not dissolving the oceans, or was dissolving the oceans much more slowly than people had thought. And as a result, it had to be going somewhere. It had to be staying in the atmosphere. But at the time, it's this really neat thing now where you, you know, right, where you, when the Polaris Project folks are going to be in Russia, um, we are going to measure carbon dioxide dissolved in, in water. We're going to measure carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. Um, and we're going to just do it with these sort of little instruments and some, um, uh, and sort of measure it on the fly like that. In Ravel's time, measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide was really, really hard. Uh, in fact, couldn't be done. There was thought there was too much noise, and it, there was the technology didn't exist to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So no one knew if there was carbon dioxide accumulating in the atmosphere. There was a couple of people that thought there there was it was accumulating, but there was no careful measurements been made. So Ravel, being again this point in his career, being this administrator, this sort of band leader of science, um, hired this this guy, Dave Keeling, to make these measurements. Now, Keeling was a geophysicist. Uh, we're getting into the modern era, um, and some of us uh, met Keeling before he died. Um, and uh, Keeling was the guy that, that Ravel hired to make measurements of atmospheric CO2. And the idea was that you were going to hire Keeling, and uh, Keeling was this um, um, person that took these measurements were very difficult to make, and Keeling was careful to the point of being a fanatic about uh, making, these, making these very, very careful measurements. Okay, the, the work of measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide at the time was this incredibly painstaking method. It had to be done every few hours. It had to be done um, in incredibly pristine conditions, and it was a challenging measurement uh, to make. It involved a lot of calibration uh, using uh, spectrophotometers. Um, and so this is what Ravel said later on. He said, Keeling's a peculiar guy. He wants to measure CO2 in his belly, and he wants to measure with the greatest precision and the greatest accuracy he possibly can. Now, uh, I know a couple of analytic chemists, and uh, I'm sure a lot of the other faculty members here do uh, as well, and some of the students probably, if you have any you know, friends that are atmospheric or are an analytic uh, chemists, uh, you'll know that they're a peculiar breed. They're wound pretty tight. And so you, what you read between the lines here, uh, Ravel is talking about Keeling, is that uh, Keeling was wound up pretty tight. He made these measurements. He wanted to make these measurements perfectly and precisely and uh, as, with the greatest accuracy he could. Okay? Now, Ravel hired Keeling, and Keeling went down to, he, in, to Antarctica and um, then later in Hawaii and made these measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide. They had to be, made, they had to be measured in places where there was no, not a, where there, they were, uh, the air was very pure. Okay? There wasn't a lot of, um, contamination from human activities, it was not contamination from ecosystem 
effects. It had to be these very precise, very pure measurements. And the idea was is that Keeling was going to go down in the late 50s, and he was going to measure atmospheric carbon dioxide, and then he was going to come back 10 years later and make another measurement after establishing this baseline and figure out if atmospheric carbon dioxide had gone up. What was absolutely amazing about Keeling and his anal retentive nature was that he was able to make these measurements, and he was able to make them so precisely and so accurately that they were able to show that carbon dioxide was accumulating even over the short time periods that he was measuring them, uh, 1957, 1958, that atmospheric carbon dioxide levels were going up. Now, Keeling started this measurement in Antarctica in this very pristine environment. He had to do these things like uh, his initial measurements were being in, in, impacted by the diesel generators that are nearby, so he moved them around again. He was just really perfectionist about it. But Keeling was no dummy and um, realized that you could spend your time in Antarctica measuring carbon dioxide like this, or you could go to Hawaii and make the measurements there instead. Uh, and so Keeling, uh, uh, no fool that he was, decided to, to take advantage of this observatory on Mauna Loa in Hawaii that was way out in the Pacific, it was a really high observatory. It was above the inversion layer. It was this perfect place to make measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And Keeling started measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide at Mauna Loa. Again, it was still painstaking chemistry that had to be done on this, uh, on these atmospheric samples. Remember, we were measuring things in the parts per billion. Okay, it was a, uh, parts per million. It was a very difficult measurement to be making at the time of an inert, or uh, not very reactive gas. Um, but Keeling kept at it, and he was able to not only show this annual increase in carbon dioxide, but he was able to show the seesaw effect of atmospheric carbon dioxide going up and going down as the northern hemisphere breathed from summer to winter and ecosystem photosynthesis and respiration were taking place. You go to 1971, okay, Keeling's been making these measurements now um, from 1958 sort of onward. And here is a uh, here's the graph of what now we, we now call the Keeling curve in the honor of, on the honor of Keeling, which shows shows this steady increase going up. And this is from a report from 1971, inadvertent climate modification study of man's impact on climate. Okay. Starting in about 1971 and going forward, the scientific community, for the most part, bought into what, essentially what we think of as Occam's razor now, that we're putting a heat-trapping gas in the atmosphere. We know it's accumulating in the atmosphere. Okay, from Arrhenius up till Keeling, we didn't know the carbon dioxide was accumulating. Okay, we knew the physics would work, but we didn't know it was accumulating in the atmosphere. So once we really understand that carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere, we now understand that the climate's going to warm up. Okay? So these measurements have continued to be made Here's the up-to-the-date up the measurement. Okay, measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is sort of this cottage industry now, and there's 8 million places you can go and find measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, you know, uh, in a year or two, we'll be up to 400 parts per million, uh, up from 280 uh, pre-industrially, and we'll, we'll, we'll be at double pre-industrial levels uh, before too long. At this point, the history lesson in climate change is essentially over. We've done all of the really big, important things in climate change right now. Going back to Fourier, Fourier realized that there had to be something keeping the, the Earth warmer um, than it would be without any gas in the atmosphere. He knew there had to be something going on, something, something, something containing in this dark energy. Tyndall calculated what the gases were that were doing that. It was water vapor and carbon dioxide. Arrhenius came along and figured out that you could calculate uh, temperature from carbon dioxide and that temperatures were going to increase in the atmosphere as people changed the concentration of, of heat-trapping gases. Um, Soyce Ravel's uh, colleague, uh, which I didn't really talk about really, but he's the one that figured out that the isotopic signature of atmospheric carbon dioxide was consistent with being from a fossil source, not from, uh, not from an ecosystem source and not from the oceans. Um, and then Ravel showed that it was primarily from fossil fuel burning, and then Keeling shows that it's going up very quickly. From the time that Keeling showed atmospheric carbon dioxide was rising onward, the scientific majority of sci atmospheric scientists and climate scientists really understood that there was a certain small number of forcings on the planet's temperature. Okay? Heat-trapping gas is being a really important one. 
that if you increase the amount of heat trap and gas in the atmosphere, temperatures are going to go up. So going from the 70s uh, onward to Jim Hansen and then to the IPCC, which issued its first report uh, in 1990, the overwhelming scientific consensus has been what, what all of you know, is that putting heat trap and gas in the atmosphere traps heat. In some ways, this is a, um, uh, this is a really unexciting uh, conclusion to over 100 years of scientific inquiry. Okay, we're really back to where we started. And the reason we're back to where we started on climate science is that it's physics. Okay? And the basics, again, of the, the physical causes of the greenhouse effect are very, very, very well understood. Um, and we understood those for over 120 years because it's physics, and physics is easy. Okay? Physics is the easiest thing to solve. One of the tragedies of, uh, of universities um, is that we take some of our most quantitative and brightest students and we, uh, we make them solve the easiest problems. Okay? They come to universities and we take the kids that are really good in math and we make uh, really good, really strong quantitative students and we make them major in physics. Um, or they end up majoring in physics because it's easy. Okay? And physics is easy because it's tractable. There's, a, there's often solutions at the end of the day. The physics of the climate system are relatively simple and we've understood those for over a century. The, the wrinkle that held us up in understanding climate science was the chemistry. Okay, because physics, physics is easy, chemistry is a little bit harder. So the physics is easy compared to the chemistry. The chemistry took us until, um, you know, really into the 50s and 60s to figure out what was going on with this chemical reaction between the atmosphere and the oceans. Where we are right now in climate science is really trying to uh, understand a lot of the biology that goes on. A lot of the work we do in the Polaris Project has to do with, bio, with the interface between biology and chemistry. Okay. Um, um, uh, some of the scientists that are involved you know, identify as, as being biogeochemists, like John Shade is a, is a biogeochemist, which I think is just, he just likes to say that because it makes him sound very smart. Um, the biology is tough. We haven't gotten that all figured out. The reason climate change is a tough sell, though, to people, world, you know, people in industrialized countries, um, people anywhere, is not because of the physics and it's not because of the chemistry. The physics is easy, the chemistry is a little harder, and the biology is a little harder than the chemistry. But all of these pale in comparison to trying to understand how human societies work. Okay? And so when people talk about being skeptics of climate change or, um, or that they, they don't believe in climate change, but they're, they're not saying they don't believe in the physics, because the physics is really well understood. They're not saying they don't believe in the chemistry, the chemistry is really understood. And the biology we're getting a handle on. The human societies are the hardest part, and the psychology of climate science is perhaps the most daunting thing that's out there. Okay, the physics is pretty easy to understand. The scientists tend to respond to data, and they tend to respond to understanding the physical sciences, and physics and chemistry and biology. And so for that reason, this idea about scientific consensus is, is, is fundamentally solid, is that these are sort of position statements from some of the major uh, scientific uh, societies in the U.S. There's the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science, Field of Published Science Magazine. Uh, there's the Geological Society of America, okay, the, the geologists, right, the people that bring you gas and oil. Um, and then the American Geophysical Union in the upper right-hand corner up here, and then the American Meteorological Society, okay. And these, all these position papers say fundamentally the same thing. But the evidence is clear. Global climate change is caused by humans. It's occurring now, and it's a growing threat. Okay, they all say the same thing. Again, it's because the physics the chemistry and the biology are all fairly well understood. Okay? This is not just in the US, this is all over the, all over the world. This is, a joint, uh, this is a statement by the Joint Academies of Sciences from, uh, uh, from many nations where I have uh, Academy of Sciences that, that uh, say that, you know, while there's always uncertainty, uh, understanding something as complex as the climate, there's now strong evidence that global warming is happening and it's caused by people. Okay, this is happening. This is happening from the, the National Academies of all these different countries that sort of signed on to this. This is a really, uh, this is a really simple problem to understand in terms of the physics and in terms of the chemistry. It's a very hard problem to come to grips with from a societal perspective. And so, going back to Occam's razor, the simplest answer tends to be the right answer. That's certainly true in climate science. The simplest answer in climate science is that if you put a heat trapping gas in the atmosphere, it's going to trap heat. Now, we 
have very, very high confidence in this because we understand how the science works. We don't think there's a monkey underneath the bed that's going to come and pull the blanket off of us. We think the blanket's on there and it's going to trap heat. When I speak to public audiences um, who might not have scientific training on this, I usually take a moment at the end to explain how the scientific process works. And how the scientific process works is that you come up, uh, you have a hypothesis, you collect data, you test that hypothesis, um, and then you make some inference based on that. And the way that you become a famous scientist is to overturn something that has been uh, is, is thought to uh, be established science. That's fundamentally how science works. If I could demonstrate that putting a heat trapping gas in the atmosphere didn't trap heat, it would be a really big deal. I would be a really famous scientist. Um, okay, it would be up there with uh, if 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 I Andy Bunn show that climate change that putting heat trapping gas in the atmosphere doesn't trap heat. Okay, it becomes Darwin, Einstein, and Bunn. Okay, it is, would be a really big deal because it would overturn a hundred plus years of basic, basic black body physics. It would overturn fundamentally how we understand the oceans to work. It would under, fundamentally how we understand everything about the Earth system to function. It would be a really big scientific discovery. And uh, if I could do that, I certainly would. Okay, it would be very, very exciting science because it would rewrite it would rewrite the textbook on how we understand the Earth system to work, um, and it would be uh, you know it would just be an amazing thing to be able to discover. I'm not holding my breath that I will be able to figure that out. Okay, um, I think the scientific evidence is overwhelming that putting heat trapping gas in the atmosphere will trap heat. But rest assured, and this is I have tremendous confidence in the scientific process that if there is some way that someone might show that that putting a heat trapping gas in the atmosphere doesn't trap heat, and someone can show that, uh, that they will do that and it will become the biggest scientific discovery of the century. Okay? Don't hold your breath for it, but you never know, it could happen. Um, when someone says that they, uh, there's disagreement among scientists and that there's no agreement on climate science, uh, what you need to understand is that that is sort of patently not true. Um, and that if someone was able to convincingly show that putting heat trapping gas in the atmosphere doesn't trap heat, it would be an incredible scientific discovery. Um, and if that, person, that happens, I'll be, the first person to sh I'll be the first one to shake that person's hand, but I'm not holding my breath for it. So Occam's razor applies in two ways. Occam's razor applies in that putting heat trapping gas in the atmosphere is going to trap heat. That's the simplest answer. Okay? The other thing is that the other way Occam's razor applies to understanding climate science is that if there was a way to show the climate uh, that, that uh, the foundation of climate science were wrong, a scientist would, sh would show that. That's how scientists get rewarded. Okay, so Occam's razor applies in sort of two fundamentally different ways. Um, that's it for the talk. That's the end last slide I have. I know Sarah's got uh, a couple things uh, she wants to talk about. And so maybe I'll turn it over to Sarah, and then I can uh, answer some questions if anyone's got any. Sarah? All right, I think you guys can hear me now. That was a great presentation. Thank you, Andy. That was really stunning. I'm sure that the audience was uh, pretty uh, pretty astounded by how well-rounded and how, how much you put in there. That was great. Um, I just want to say thank you for that. And I will just let it open up for questions now. If you want, you can certainly um, raise your hand, and we'll know that you have a question if you'd like to ask it live. Um, you can also ask in the chat box there if you want. But you can go ahead and um, raise your hand here. It's uh, right below the, where it says participants if you want to ask a question. Andy, this is uh, Max Holmes. I was just wondering if you could comment upon the response that you've gotten in public audiences when you give this talk, and particularly I like the analogy or the what you say at the end about you know Einstein, Newton, and Bunn. And I mean that really is powerful to me. I think there's often a perception that we all kind of walk in lockstep and tout the party line, but it's a it's a neat insight 
to to get out there that you know would all love to prove everyone wrong and become rich and famous. Sure. Um, yeah. So you know, I I get a uh, I get a lot of uh, I get a lot of call to to talk to uh, non traditional scientific non traditional audiences about this this topic. Um, you know, people from the, the ag extension to uh, business forums, etc. And first thing is, I find that they respond really well to history. Um, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people really, really get into storytelling and really get into understanding how, uh, you know, they, how, trying to imagine how things were, you know, in times that they 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 haven't lived in. So I think that's a really powerful way of talking to people about it. And I've gotten a lot of respect for people that that try and associate um, associate this history. A lot of the stuff I got from this came from this really marvelous uh, book on the history of climate science. Um, uh, that's a free book that's available from the uh, American Institute of Physics uh, by Spencer Wirt. Um, it's a great book. Um, <clears throat> the last thing, sort of the how science works and the Darwin, Einstein, and Bunn analogy, I found that to be to be uh, to be effective at convincing people that there is no that there's no scientific conspiracy. That the scientific consensus is maybe the most precious of all. Uh, things to try and get because scientists they make their living trying to trying to disprove each other, um, and when people understand that analogy, when people understand the reward system for how scientists uh, how scientists work. That I think that 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 actually does start to score points with them, and they start to appreciate it. So, um, <clears throat> um, so I found that to be I found that to be very powerful. I think particularly talking to uh, places like Chamber of Commerce and, and business groups, etc. Uh, they understand that <clears throat> because they a lot of times most people don't understand how what the reward system is in science, um, and so explaining that I think is a really powerful thing. I'm going to post a link of uh, Spencer Wirt's uh, online uh, book. You can order the actual book, or you can look at it online, um, and I'll just post the link in there, and it'll give you it'll give you both uh, both things. And it's really it's a great read. I make I make my students all read, and they all sort of grumble about it initially, and then they love the book. Especially because it keeps them from reading their physics books. Great, thanks for putting that up there, John, and thanks for mentioning that, Andy. I see uh, Barb has her hand up. I don't know what that. Uh, if I can do anything about that or not. Yeah, sure. Barb, um, I just have a question. Go ahead and touch down the top. Okay, thanks. Um, great talk. My question had to do with the pH of the ocean and how that, uh, you, you touched on that a little bit. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, so, um, I yeah, so um, uh, I'm getting an echo now. Uh, it's gone now. Okay, um, so we can go back to that. I can go back and look at that slide, too. Um, so this gets in a little bit to, uh, to uh, things like ocean acidification, which is a Arguably, a bigger global change than climate change will be in terms of the geologic impact. And, you know, we're going to be seeing the the impacts of ocean acidification in the, in the, in the stratigraphic record of the Earth, probably. Um, so, when carbonic acid uh, dissolves, when, car when carbonic acid forms in the water, it dissolves into bicarbonate and carbonate ions. And when that happens, that that ion is that. Uh, it has a negative charge. Okay, bicarbonate has a has a negative one charge, and carbon has a negative two charge. And those hydrogen ions peel off, and that's what acidity is. Okay, acidity is measuring the amount of hydrogen ions that are in something. And so, um, what this means chemically is that this reaction of dissolving carbon dioxide in seawater is a buffered reaction. Okay, and what a, a buffered reaction means that it's in this case that it, it's slowed down, and that it's that the amount of carbonate and bicarbonate ions that exist in seawater is a function of, of, an o of ocean pH. It's a function of the acidity of the ocean. And you can see just from this reaction that as the carbon dioxide uh, dissolves into water, it's releasing more of these hydrogen ions. And this is the, what's now we call these, the ocean acidification taking place. Now, the oceans are still actually alkaline, um, but, uh, uh, but it's, uh, we, we, 
we phrase it now as, as ocean acidification as opposed to oceans becoming less alkaline, uh, even though that's still really what's going on. Does that help? Probably so. Looks like Joy is typing. I don't know if she'll have a question here in just a second. All right. Well, uh, if nobody has any other questions, we can kind of wrap it up. We're exactly on time here. Anything else that you wanted to add, Andy, or Max, or John? Is there anything you'd like to share? I'm uh, uh, I'm good. I really appreciated the chance because I've never done um, I've never done a lecture like this and put it put into the online world. And, and I think the software works great. And I hope everyone enjoyed it. I think it was a good experience. Yeah, this is Max. I'd just like to thank Andy again for doing this, and Arcus and Polar Trek for hosting it. And everyone who's out there listening for participating. Um, we didn't really say much about the Polaris project, which uh, many of us are part of, but I'd encourage you to check out our website if you don't know about us. It's uh, www.thepolarisproject.org. It's this thing's been going on since 2008, and each Summer, we take a pretty big group of uh, people, undergraduate students, grad students, postdocs, faculty to the Siberian Arctic to try to figure out how the Arctic's responding to climate change, to global warming, and also how changes in the Arctic are feeding back to the global climate system. I think in 2008 there were 12 of us that participated, with six faculty and six undergraduate students, I believe, and uh, this year we're up to 33 people. That's almost certainly the largest international expedition to the Siberian Arctic ever. So we have a really big group going to a really remote part of the Arctic, and we're learning a lot of neat things. Um, so again, yeah, thanks thanks to everybody. Thanks to Andy and Polar Track and Arcus and, and all you guys. All right, see you all later. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And if anyone right, has other care. questions. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Take care. All right, you can also follow Mark Parisio, the Polar Trek teacher there. The link is um, on there too. All right, have a great evening and take care.